who died when she was two. Stein, she was a matriarch of the family and kept the traditions very uh, ultra orthodox. Still kept the traditions for 24 hour fasts on the great feast days. But the thing is about uh, Jewishness is that it never left Yiddish consciousness. And in fact, even after her conversion to Christianity and the anti Semitic persecution she faced, uh, she sharpened, it sharpened her realization that Judaism and Christianity are merged into a single redemptive unity. And this is from her own words. Beneath the cross, I understand the destiny of God's people. Indeed, today, I know it far better what it means to be the Lord's bride under the sign of a cross. But since it is a mystery, it can never be understood by reason alone. And this is one of the great things I find about the Catholic Church, is we kind of talk more about uh, Israel and the joining of the Old Testament and the New Testament together. Uh, it's only recently, actually, that, uh, especially the uh, Anglican Church, actually talks about the, the, you know, where the fulfillment of the Israel's, Israel's promise. So if you ever go through the Old Testament, there's always that sense of longing, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, the Catholic Church uh, is really good at expressing this. But, unfortunately, the Jewishness was to prove a controversial thing because, uh, unfortunately, the, during the occupied, she was, during the occupation of uh, Holland and Belgium, there were Catholics who forgot that, you know, the Jews are our sis, you know, sister and, you know, just went to Mass and then would, the day after Mass, order the deportation of about 10,000 Jews and think nothing of it, which is the tragedy of it as well. But thankfully, uh, the church in Lumen Gentum said, no, they are to be respected. Uh, but also, unfortunately, it was to prove a source of conflict in her own family because uh, later I'll go on to it uh, her mother was deeply upset by her becoming Catholic and when she became a nun she said why did you have to get to know him this is talking about Jesus he was a good man I'm not saying anything against him but why did he have to go and make himself God and I think this kind of that misunderstanding of it, that, and we see it, you know, throughout our uh, society, why did he have to make himself God? Because she followed the truth, uh, which is God, is, you know, Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, you know, Israel's fulfillment. And also that calling as well, uh, when I was doing research, Psalm 44, uh, the great bridal, royal bridal psalm says, Listen, O daughter, give ear to my words, forget your own people and your father's house, so the king will desire your beauty. And this is it, because we're all here as your name to do God a service. And God desires us and loves us. And sorry, the phone's just connecting. Uh, but also, there's also the sense of tragedy as well, because she was born on the 12th of October, which in the Jewish calendar is the high feast of Yom Kippur. And does anyone know what that means? <coughs> the feast Basically, it's the Day of Atonement. So, catch your mind 2,000 years to when the temple was still intact. The pre high priest would cross the Holy of Holies, which no person could do, and sacrifice a lamb in atonement for the sins of the nation. And also on that day, he and he alone could say the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Otherwise, and only he on that day, otherwise it was considered blasphemous and 
yet stoning awaited. And <coughs> this idea of atonement uh, goes through her life uh, because both her mother and Edith, her Edith herself, it's obviously a mark of an election, but unfortunately, by election was the cross and it was looming, uh, looming out from her birth. So, uh, so now we're moving on to from the age of about 14 to 21. And like all the good saints, and I do mean the good saints, she was a gifted child, uh, but she was also a little terror as well. Uh, for, if you ever read her biography, she used to storm off and like every, like a child, just te scream her place down, banging, uh, banging everything. Uh, just to show, you know, that a saint's not perfect. But she was uh, very gifted it, from her academic career. And throughout her life, uh, there was a real intelligence, an iron will, because she seriously did not like not getting her own way, but also a strong sense of duty and a natural desire to be of help. But, uh, at academic year, she still abandoned her faith from about the age of 13. She just, for whatever reason, due to her being in school, uh, where that she just abandoned it. She still went to the high feasts and stuff. She still went to temple, but only for her love of her mother. She just stopped praying. And instead, what she tried to do was begin a quest for truth, to work out the meaning. But as uh, Blessed John Paul II said in her canonization, she sought the truth and she found God. And the little quote is from St. Teresa of Avila, who uh, features prominently in this talk. So, but uh, her quest for God actually begins round about the age of 18, when she en enrolled in the University of Gotham. <laughs> Gotham? Yeah. We'll go with that. Uh, where she read philosophy under Purcell, who is important because he's the founder of a phenomenology. Phenomenology. School. Yes. I don't know what it means, but there's two priests here who really do so. <laughs> they know. Uh, all I got was uh, attempts to discover the truth, and then it just went. <sighs> but <clears throat> why it's important? Because. Edith wrote, uh, helped her to be introduced to a guy called Max Scheller, who also, funnily enough, was a Jewish convert to Catholicism. And she was greatly influenced by this set of people uh, because <coughs> he placed humility, uh, talking about his faith, a uh, foundation of all moral endeavor, and argued uh, for the sake of purpose of this endeavor was to lead the individual to the loss of self in God and ultimately to the resurrection. And Edith, who kind of knew about Christianity, but, you know, it was just, oh, Catholicism, don't they just like go around kneeling and kissing priests' feet and their hands and, you know, just very old superstitious things, said, it was my first contact with a world that until then had been completely unfamiliar. I can't say it led me directly to faith. It did, it did open my mind to a whole new realm that I wouldn't be able to pass by blindly anymore. So, and also, again, within his group of friends were uh, Adolf and Anna Reichen, who, uh, again, were Lutheran, uh, Lutheran converts, uh, though Jewish um, converted to Lutheranism, which is basically kind of like Anglicanism. Uh, and the thing is, it was through this, but it was her first encounter with the cross. Uh, because unfortunately, Adolf died in Flanders during the Great War. And you know, through that tragedy, God managed to work uh, to actually touch her because 
when she saw uh, her friend Anna, you know, you know, she expected grief, but yet she saw hope. And uh, it says, and she said, this is from her diaries as well. It was my first encounter with a cross and the divine power that it bestows on those who carry it. For the first time, I was seen with my very eyes, the church, born of her redeemer's sufferings, triumphant over the sting of death. That was the moment my unbelief collapsed and Christ shone forth in the mystery of a cross. And from, it's, that is actually quite powerful stuff. It's still, you know, even though I am a convert, I was, just to have that from Anglicanism, you know, I kind of still know that, you know, Jesus died on the cross. For someone who never experienced that, that is one of the most powerful things, that image of the cross, just shining in glory and filling her friend with hope. Uh, a time of immense suffering, political upheaval, is quite staggering. But, do you think she actually became Catholic after this experience? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> actually, no she didn't. This happened in 1917, but it wasn't until 1920. Uh, 22 that she actually became Catholic. Instead, what happened was she wasn't quite there yet. It was what uh, St. John of the Cross calls the spiritual night. She wasn't quite willing to surrender herself totally to God. And this is the thing God intellectually, yes, but God needs a complete surrender of the will in order for a uh, metamorphosis to occur. However, but, God being God, he didn't give up on her, and she didn't give up either. Uh, there is, sorry, because, uh, I was going, she still had to count as there was a woman in the, uh, she was at a cathedral one day, and the great Catholic thing to do is, you know, with your shopping, just go say a prayer, thank you God, you know, I got that, you know, clothes at half price in our class. Yes! Uh, and for someone who never experienced that, especially in te uh, from temple or even Protestants of churches where the church is locked up, you know, just to see someone do that and have a conversation, uh, a talk with God, just blew her mind. And she, even till her dying day, she never forgot it. But the final blow came to her doubts came in 1921 because she was staying with her friends and being ungracious hosts, they just left her alone in the house while they went off shopping or something. So, but they left her books. So actually, so the book that she spent a lot of time reading about was the life of Saint Therese of Avila, who is a 17th no, 16th century mystic who basically <coughs> reformed the Carmelite order and was one of the leading figures in the Counter -Ref Reformation. So, yeah, I would recommend Wikipedia her. She's really a really good state. And the thing was, she spent the whole night reading it, and after putting it down, she just said, This is truth. And the truth was, what she was forgetting was God is love and he doesn't reveal his mysteries to intend it alone, but to the heart that surrenders itself to him. And <coughs> Saint Therese of Avila said that this uh, inner resistance, you know, which denies us offering ourselves completely to God, is through prayer, and that's inner prayer. And that never left her. Throughout her life, uh, every person who came in contact to her said that was her lifeblood. Uh, one abbot remarked, all she wanted was to be with God in church and to have the great mysteries right in front of her. 
and yeah, and after this experience, she bought a missile, catechism, and impressed the priest, a local priest so much, she was baptized on January the 1st, 1922, and confirmed on Candlemas that following year. And this way of life really interests me because I see elements of my own conversion story as well, because basically I was kind of a Anglican, but I kind of led not a very good Christian life in that just basically to the end of moral bankruptcy and just, yeah, and just actually started reading St. Augustine and also about the history of the church. And that's when I thought, oh, the Catholic Church actually is right, you know, the church which Christ rested to authority. And as Father Keith can tell you, on my first visit there, I was standing right there next to a radiator in the corner just looking cheapish while he was there in his green vestments, actually. Uh, yeah, and also the gospel reading was a chaos as well. Uh, right. And claim to Carmel. So this is her when she, uh, either when she was baptized or when she became a nun. So I'll let you choose which one. And the poem is from her own uh, lovely thing. But unfortunately, it gets darker as uh, time moves on. But this actually sprung to my mind today when a bishop's talk on Saturday when he said Christianity is a joy, but it does not that joy doesn't exclude suffering. It's how we deal with that suffering. And Edith, Edith Stein uh, was happy, uh, even though she suffered, she was happy to be in the service of the church. Uh, and even from 1921, she was always drawn to a religious order. She first tried uh, the being a Benedictine, didn't quite suit her, but her first love was always the Carmelite order. And but unfortunately, she didn't really enter the convent out of respect to her spiritual advisors because she was really intelligent uh, and a natural speaker. They kind of thought you can do work outside uh, an enclosed order, and so she went on trips around the world, uh, telling women how to live in the spirit of Jesus and voca the vocation and formation of women while also translating Blessed John Henry Newman and St. Thomas Aquinas into German and giving commentaries on it, which are still considered very uh, influential today. But by 1933, she was a teacher in uh, Munster, but unfortunately, uh, she had to end it. And does anyone know why? Nineteen thirty three. That's when Hitler came to power and he started enacting the Orion laws. So basically to be a teacher or hold public office you had to be of pure Orion blood. And yeah. 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 yes, I get confused with the heresies. Uh, but despite the setback, she didn't let it get to her. Instead, she saw that tragedy and said, might this be the time to enter Carmel? And she spent about a good 13 hours before the Blessed Sacrament in her local church and said, the answer got yes. And she entered uh, the Cologne Carmel, singing for joy as a child to its mother's arms, never doubting her almost blind enthusiasm for an instant. And that's a very, and that kind of for me is the element of vocation as well. Once you know, you know, God, give yourself fully to God, and that's why you know it inspires, makes you happy, and yeah, just feeling that you're right. 
And also, uh, she took the name Teresa Benedict Alcurtze. And, you know, again, the cross at this stage, again, lo was looming and becoming more real to her. Uh, and also, her love of St. Therese and St. Benedict. And throughout this period, uh, she made uh, one of her, even as a nun, she was, even though she was about 44 at the time, she made that profound impact through her prayer and also being humble as well. She, even though she hated getting up and cooking, cooking on scrubbing floors, she did it out of love for God. And also, again, uh, philosophy as well, because uh, one of her most important works is the science of a cross, which hopefully one day may make her doctor of the church, but pray for that. Uh, it's basically, I can't have, don't have a copy of it, hinting Christmas present. Uh, but it's, the essence of it is summarized by Blessed John Paul II, and it says, the love of Christ and human freedom are intertwined because love and truth have an intrinsic relationship. Truth and love need each other. Do not accept any, anything as a truth if it lacks love, and do not accept anything as love which lacks truth. One without the other becomes a destructive lie. And you could mean it for those who were there on Saturday, kind of links to what uh, the bishop was talking about on Saturday. So, possible talk. And so now we move on to the gap being storm. And this, uh, this is, this was actually written three months after Hitler assumed power. And Edith was under no illusion at all uh, about what the Nazis were, like why opposed to God, uh, the church, and human beings. Uh, but she actually did two things. Firstly, she uh, extract, she used, asked the church to uh, denounce the Nazis' policies, especially against the Jews. And even though we don't have an idea of what the Pope Pius actually read this letter, uh, it's interesting to note that in 1937 he issued an encyclical called Mit Rendender where he, <laughs> he uh, criticised the Nazis, uh, Nazis' policies and condemned anti-Semitism and even before his death in 1939 was in the process of writing uh, another encyclical condemning racism and anti-Semitism. And I, boy, I think he did read it. And like any good pope, with, even with Catherine of Siena, he listened to a woman and because she was right. But uh, also was the atonement that we talked about, where I talked about Yom Kippur, she offered herself up as a sacrifice and she now, from when it was in power, she, sorry, she had to atone for it. Uh, and there's lovely stories where she uh, saw a Jewish person being beat, beaten up and she was so horrified by it that she said, an atonement has to be made. And she then, idea in the consciousness developed of Queen Esther from the Bible. Does anyone know the story? Book of Esther. Yes. Uh, she actually started seeing herself as an Esther. And this is the excerpt from when she was in the Netherlands. Uh, I firmly believe that the Lord has accepted my life as an offering for all. It's important for me to keep Queen Esther in mind. Remember how she was separated from her people just so that she could intercede for them before the king. I myself certainly am a poor and insignificant little Esther. But I take comfort from the fact 
but the king who has chosen me is infinitely kind and merciful. And from this period onwards, she, people say she, uh, there was a change, she didn't anticipate a life of suffering. She was living a life of suffering and uniting her, uh, her atonement with the cross as well. Because and she was, uh, there was an eerie expectation that God had answered her and taken uh, her life up in atonement uh, for the Jewish people's survival. And this final revelation came at, in 1938 it, during the Crystal Act, where basically uh, German Nazis thugs, whoever decided to just beat up any Jew in the street, murder them, uh, synagogues were just destroyed, shops uh, smashed, and basically that's when they say the rule of law just ended in Germany. Uh, and again, the idea of atonement came, uh, even with any doubts, uh, and she offered herself uh, about, she said, I offer myself to, for her, her life, for her people. And this is humanity at its finest, when we unite ourselves with God. Uh, is everyone okay? Keeping up? And despite this, uh, the Carmelite order actually sensing the danger, decided to uh, move her to the Eck Carmel in Holland, hoping to flee persecution. But by 1940, the war was in full swing and the lowlands had fallen. And with all the Jewish people, regardless of, uh, regardless of whether they were converted to Christianity or not, were interrogated by the Gestapo, forced to register with a Council of Jewish Affairs, which sounds really nice until you realise that it was a cover so that the Nazis had a record of every Jew in Holland. Forced to wear the Star of David, uh, and basically uh, the Nazis encouraged, you know, just this assault them, you know, just strip them of any protection, you know, human dignity. And despite uh, <coughs> this, you know, even though the Nazis, how the Nazis was, no, 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 the Christians, Christian Jews, they won't be affected. Uh, they, the church actually took action. And this is the church at its finest. Because seeing uh, the deportations were happening, and they knew, you know, even though it was to German territory, that was just, uh, they knew it was a byword for a concentration camp. Uh, and this, because uh, a lot of people say, where was the church during World War II? I say it was there. They took that stand against it. It was also with St. Maximilian Kobe when he was hiding about 200 Jews. Uh, it was with Blessed John the 23rd where he was baptizing Jews just to give them, uh, just to get them, give them travel pass so they could get out of uh, the just escape the Nazis. So even though. Uh, the modern world likes it to be bells and whistles. Oh, I did this, I did this. It, the church doesn't. It operated uh, in a calm and, you know, very secretive way. Because it, when dealing with human, you know, human dignity, it doesn't go for bells and whistles. But unfortunately, uh, and. Uh, basically, the response was swift uh, because uh, they, 
your weight. Uh, basically, uh, there is a he decided to attack the church through the Jewish Catholics. But uh, there is a bit of controversy uh, over her beatification because some say it was just because she was Jewish. That's it. But from the evidence, it was because the Catholic bishops took a stand against uh, the Nazis. And also from uh, Protestants as well, they were arrested but indiscriminately. This was just a mass uh, roundup of all Catholic Jews. And the Protestants were, even though they were together, they actually moved them to a different concentration camp uh, or stop off station, and then they were allowed to return to uh, the Netherlands, basically. Uh, and this happened, uh, well, the Catholic Jews were uh, basically sent to Auschwitz. And basically in the evening of the 2nd of August of 1942, uh, they, the Gishkapo came for her and still embracing the cross, she said, uh, you united our sufferings with Christ and said to her sister who, was, who had also converted, Rosa, come, the again für unser Werk, which means, Rosa, come, we are going for the life of my, our people. And from that, uh, the 5th to the 7th, she basically was the spiritual leader of all the Catholic Jews, and she was interned at Westbrook. And I think she exemplifies Christ in his passion when, he crown, when his crown reforms. Uh, because despite everything, she uh, kept their dignity. She restored their dignity to them. Uh, because she ensured that prayers were said, masses which were forbidden were said, and confessions. Uh, uh, priests were able to pastor their flock. And one of the most moving things was she looked after the children, who their mothers knew what was going to happen, and they despaired. And they kind of just abandoned their children uh, in despair. But yet she, yeah, she fed on more to them. And as I say again, gave them back their dignity when all around were trying to destroy it. And then, from the 7th, we actually, this is the last time we see St. Edith, uh, Edith uh, alive. And we're not sure when she entered Auschwitz. Uh, but the evidence suggests she was martyred on the 9th of August, uh, 1942, and she was 51 years old. But that isn't the end of the story. Because in 1988, uh, she was beatified by Blessed John Paul II, who, had a, who knew of her and I don't know, was drawn to her life. Uh, and then in 1998, uh, she was canonized after uh, a miracle uh, attributed to her intercession where a young child had swallowed a lot of medicine, paracetamol, and her father asked Edith Stein, because he was from that area and knew about her, to pray for her. And the, she was uh, sitting up in bed talking, and yeah, that's a miracle. And also, she's a the patroness of Europe, one of the patronesses of Europe as well. Uh, so, yeah, and this is alive also. And yeah, that's. But one final thing, I'm sure Edith Stein would would not uh, disapprove, is this is the only uh, list of the Catholic Jews who were murdered. It's not a complete list. We will never actually you know. We reckon about 133 to about 144 Catholics died because of the church's stance. And yeah.
And that's actually one of the most tragic things because uh, they were only teenagers as well. And then you say, Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let them be the light shine upon them. them. May, they May they rest in peace. peace. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Martyrs, pray for Amen. us. And Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, pray for, for us. us. The end. <laughs>